Hello there. Welcome back to Jenny Designs with Paper and this week's episode of Crime and Coloring. Now that we're back on track alphabetically, we will be talking about the great state of Delaware. So get comfy and let's get crafty. Before we talk crime, let's talk coloring. I wasn't sure what I wanted to color this week, so I eventually chose this all to new um, cupcake layering stamp set. I also have half of a sheet of watercolor paper, black ink, clear embossing powder, and my Zig Real Brush Clean Color watercolor markers. I also have pulled out a small paintbrush in case I need it, but most of my painting will be done with this water brush. This is just a paintbrush that has water in the barrel, so I don't need to have an open water, open pot of water on my desk. I am going to go ahead and kind of push things out of the way and put this piece of paper into my Misty. So you can see that my paper is obviously taller than my Misty, not a big deal. I am going to place the stamp, the outline image, down in the bottom left hand corner, and I am stamping on the more textured rough side of the watercolor paper. The first thing I need to do though is prepare my watercolor paper with the wrap a hole design anti static power powder tool. Man, I almost got that out. This will remove the oils from my fingers and prevent the um, embossing powder from sticking to anything but the ink on my paper. I am stamping this with this VersaClaire Nocturne Black ink and because it is such a great ink I do not need to stamp it more than one time even though I am stamping on watercolor paper. I'm going to go ahead and cover this with um, clear embossing powder and heat set that with my heat tool and I will stamp this six times. Obviously I did not make you watch that because I mean, it's interesting, but it's not a, that interesting. So for the coloring, I am going to take one color and color in the dark parts of the raised edges of this cupcake paper. And I will leave every other um, rectangle uncolored. And then I will go back and color that in with a gray um, watercolor pen later to um, create the shadows. I am just using one color and then I am blending it out with my water brush. I will um, paint the the marker, watercolor marker, the zig pen, whatever. <laughs> I will paint that down at the bottom or color the image down at the bottom and then drag that pigment um, up to the other end of the cupcake wrapper. Once I get to the middle here, there are two pieces that are kind of side by side without a shadow in between them. And then the shadows go to the other side of the, um, the, the pleat, the pleat, the pleats change direction. There we go. Words are hard, but we're getting there. The pleats change directions. And that is because it is a rounded object and the shadows would then come in from another angle. I am also making them darker, taller on the outsides and shorter in the middle to kind of give it that front um, light. All right, so that is how I'm coloring everything. I have selected a light brown for the cake and a dark brown for the frosting. And now that we're done with the coloring tutorial, because that's not what this is about, we're gonna jump into the crime. Delaware is the eighth alphabetical state and is known for being the first of the American colonies to ratify the Declaration of Independence, giving them the title First State in the Union on December 7, 1787. Delaware is also known for being settled by Swedes, being the smallest state in landmass, has been named the chemical capital of the world, has the largest population of horseshoe crabs, and is home to two million chickens. Delaware is also known for being the first time the U.S. Postal Service was used to commit murder. This is the story of two women, one man, and a very hinky box of chocolates. Our first woman, Cordelia Adelaide Brown, was born around 1854 in Kansas City, Missouri. Her parents are Richard John and Lamina Brown. Richard Brown was first or was best known as the first white settler in Brownville, Nebraska, which is named after Mr. Brown. In 1872, Cordelia married a man named Welcome 
Alpine Botkin. And later that year, the couple had one son, Beverly Brown Botkin. He was born in Missouri. Welcome was a bank teller who went on to become a prosperous grain bro broker. He moved the family to Kansas City and in the 1880s to Stockton, California. So by the time Cordelia and Welcome moved to California, Cordelia seemed to be growing tired of marriage. It is reported that sometimes she lived with her husband, sometimes she lived with relatives, sometimes she lived with her son Beverly, and sometimes she lived alone, always living in San Francisco. Her husband Welcome gave her an allowance, apparently adequate for her needs, and divorce was never brought up as an issue. It appeared that Welcome was not necessarily unhappy that Cordelia was not living with him. Cordelia was also reported as being quite a vain woman who bragged about being photographed many times in what was for the time rather brazen images, including one image where she has her hands up behind her head. And I guess that was kind of brazen for the late 1800s. But people who knew her thought this was quite funny because they didn't consider her to be a very beautiful woman. The second woman in our story is Mary Elizabeth Pennington. She was born January 14, 1863 in Dover, Delaware, and her parents were Congressman John Brown and his wife, Rebecca Pennington. Mary Elizabeth married John Preston Dunning, a newspaper reporter, on February 11, 1891. They had a daughter that they named Elizabeth in December of 1891. And the two had settled into Dover and were living happily. However, reporting the news in Dover, Delaware wasn't particularly exciting in the 1890s. So John Dunning applied for and received a job offer with the Associated Press. And this job would take him and Elizabeth and their daughter to California. John was highly regarded as was a highly regarded reporter, sorry, words are hard, for the Associated Press, having completed overseas assignments in Samoa and Chile. He had then been promoted to superintendent of the Associated Press Western Division Bureau in San Francisco. Um, their marriage was not necessarily happy, though, once they got to California. Some said it was because Mary Elizabeth um, she was described as being extremely, extremely religious and really could not get used to the conditions in San Francisco. I guess they were a bit more raunchy and raucous than Dover, Delaware. Um, Dunning, although, after moving to California, he changed. He began drinking heavily. He gambled away all of their money and spent time with many different women. Eventually, John was fired by the Associated Press when it was discovered that he had embezzled $4,000 in office funds to pay his gambling debts. He was then let go by newspapers in Salt Lake, Salt Lake City and San Francisco because he was habitually drunk. Sorry, words are hard, y'all. In 1895, Cordelia met John while he was bicycling through San Francisco's Golden Gate Park. At the time, she was 41 years old, nine years his senior. Both of them were married, but John was smitten with her. Cordelia, estranged from her husband, and by this time had taken to living in the Victoria Hotel. So John, thinking he's some kind of sly fox, took a room at the same hotel under the pretense of keeping their affair a secret. And at some point in this, this time period, John mentioned to his to Cordelia, his mistress, that his wife loved chocolate and that she had a friend in the city named Mrs. Corbley. So Mary Elizabeth, John's wife, got wind of his relationship with Cordelia sometime in 1896, and she decided she was done. She was no more turning a blind eye to John's stray life. Again, she was a very religious woman, but also she was brought up in a more um, respectable or highfalutin house, right? And I don't say that highfalutin because she should put up with cheating. I just mean that she came from a, a, a lifestyle that she was not tolerating that anymore. 
And she was no longer going to spend her days keeping her husband on the straight and narrow. So she took her daughter, whose name was Elizabeth, and she went home to Dover. She went back to her parents' house. So back home in Delaware, Mary Elizabeth began to receive strange letters telling her all about her husband's cheating ways and suggesting that she divorce him. And these letters were very upsetting. So she went to her father and asked him to intercept the letters and make sure she didn't see them. Um, he kept the letters as they continued to arrive and he did not show them to her. John and Cordelia's affair lasted almost three years, but ended in April of 1898. The United States had declared war on Spain, so the Associated Press had hired John back so that he could go cover the conflict in Puerto Rico and Cuba. But by then, John had decided that he missed his wife and his daughter. So when he left San Francisco, he told Cordelia that he would not return. In fact, reports say that he left her weeping, like she was crying publicly as he left. He planned to reconcile with his wife and did before leaving for Cuba. Hey, so here's a weird side note. While John was in Cuba reporting with the Associated Press on the Spanish-American War, or the, the, the war on Spain, um, he help the survivors of Spanish battleships that were sunk um, at the Battle of Santiago de Cuba in July of that year. So apparently there is something slightly redeeming about the man. I don't know. Friends reported that Cordelia had lost her mind over the idea of John reuniting with his wife. She wrote letters to Mary warning her against plans, any plans, to reconcile with John. Yeah, you see we're starting to click together? That summer, the summer of 1898, Cordelia went to Owl Drugstore and purchased two ounces of powdered arsenic. She reportedly was very curious about how it would be to die of arsenic poisoning. Her friends described Cordelia's manner during these few months as melancholy and almost delirious. So sounds like she's losing her mind, like really losing her mind. On July 31st, 1898, Cordelia purchased a box of chocolates from Market Street Candy Store in San Francisco. Cordelia bought the chocolates and asked the clerk, whose name was Emma Herbert, to pack them in a plain box and to leave enough room for a present, which Emma did. She next went to a novelty store called the City of Paris and bought a white handkerchief. Cordelia prepared the package neatly and anonymously. The box was fancy, but it lacked a logo needed to connect it with a Market Street candy store or to Cordelia. The chocolate bonbons that she purchased and were placed inside this box were laced with lethal, lethal amounts of arsenic. In August of 1898, the box addressed to Mrs. John P. Dunning arrived at the Dover Post Office. The Pennington family sent Mary's nephew, Harry, to pick up the mail. Harry returned and handed the package to Mary Elizabeth, and inside the package was a note that read, With love to yourself and baby, and the note was signed, Mrs. C. Mary Elizabeth mistakenly thought it was from Mrs. Laura Corbley, the friend that she had made while living in San Francisco. Under the note was a box of chocolate candies. So Mary Elizabeth, her sister Ida Dean, Ida's children, and two friends sat on the veranda and shared the candy. And almost immediately, everyone who ate the candy became violently ill with stomach pain and intense vomiting. The next morning, Mary Elizabeth Dunning died. Her sister Ida followed her in death on August 11th. Grief-stricken at losing his daughters, their father, John Pennington, thought something was suspicious. So he shared his suspicions with the attending physician, and this doctor personally took the remaining candy to Delaware College in Newark, where a chemistry professor found the candies had been laced with arsenic. Mary's father immediately launched an investigation when he noticed that the handwriting on the package of the candy matched the handwriting 
of the anonymous letters his wife had been receiving. The state of Delaware offered a $2,000 reward. The governor was quoted as saying, this is the most horrible crime that has ever occurred in our state. The person who sent the box of poison candy is as bad, yes, is worse than the miserable anarchist who throws a bomb into a crowd of innocent and unsuspecting people. Naturally, the first person law enforcement wanted to speak with was Mary's husband, John. So Mary's father, John, had hired a private detective to track down her husband, John. John was still in was still reporting on the Spanish-American War, okay? So as soon as he heard about his wife's death, he returned to Dover. And when he was told about the circumstances of her death and shown the letters that Mary Mary Elizabeth received over the years and the note accompanying the candy, he took one look at the handwriting and said, Cordelia. So despite the distance between San Francisco Cisco, oh my goodness, you guys, sorry, San Francisco and Dover, Delaware, this case was actually cracked with remarkable speed. We're talking pre-internet, pre-phone lines. I mean, people might have had phones, but I mean, come on, this is 18, late 1890s at this point. So the box, which was postmarked from San Francisco, was traced to Philadelphia, where the maker of the box confirmed that it had one client in San Francisco, and that client was a candy company. A pharmacy clerk had a record of selling arsenic to a Mrs. Bothan, who was listed at Cordelia Botkin's address. Um, The first thing they needed to do, the first order of business, was to get Cordelia in custody before she fled. And it turns out it wasn't all that difficult. She was living in Stockton, California, with her estranged husband, Welcome, and their son, Beverly. In the days following Cordelia's capture or arrest, clerks from the candy store, drugstore, and novelty shop all recognized Cordelia. Mrs. Henley from the the market shop swore the box sent to Dover was identical in every way to the one that she sold Cordelia. The postal clerk who assisted Cordelia when she mailed the package happened to be named John Dunnigan. Naturally, he remembered the box addressed to Mrs. John Dunning since the name was so similar to his own. So, The Pennington family wanted Cordelia tried for murder in Delaware. The problem was extradition laws at that time weren't the same as they are today. Cordelia had never been to Delaware, so she wasn't a fugitive from Delaware. So the family then decided they wanted her tried in California for the murder. The problem there was there was no body in California. The crime hadn't occurred in California. Cordelia's crimes really were unprecedented because they occurred through the mail and over two jurisdictions. Minimally, if you count, don't count the number of states that this package traveled through, right? So after some considerable back and forth and including um, the Supreme Court, going to the Supreme Court, a judge um, ruled or the Supreme Court rather, ruled that Judge Carol Cook would hear the case in San Francisco. This required the family of Mary Elizabeth and Ida Dean, as well as all the other witnesses, to travel to San Francisco to provide testimony. In addition to the family and other witnesses, handwriting experts were brought in, and they compared the letters and the note that accompanied the candy, and they were both found to have been written by Cordelia. In December of 1898, Cordelia was convicted of murder. She appealed and at a retrial in 1904 was convicted again. That retrial required all of the witnesses and family members to travel to California again. On February 4th, Cordelia was once again handed a life sentence. 
After her sentencing, Cordelia was remanded to the Branch County Jail rather than San Quentin State Penitentiary. Not sure why, couldn't really figure that out. But sadly, about the same time, Judge Cook's wife passed away, and he developed the habit of often visiting her grave. One Sunday, the judge was on his way to pay his respects to his late wife. To his astonishment, he saw Cordelia riding along in a streetcar. She was completely unaccompanied by any guards. As it turned out, Cordelia was trading sex favors for a bit of freedom. That is one kind of parole program, let me tell you. After the great San Francisco earthquake of 1906, the little jail in Branch County became too crowded and Cordelia could no longer enjoy the small comforts of that little jail and she was transferred to San Quentin Penitentiary. Cordelia lived the remainder of her life in prison. During her final years, the people Cordelia cared about started to die off in rapid succession. Okay, if she was not in prison, I would be super suspicious of this. Her husband, Welcome, died in May of 1904 of a heart condition, the same heart condition that would claim her son Beverly the next year. Her father passed away in California in 1900, reportedly of a horse kick to the head. Years of heavy drinking caught up with John Preston Dunning, and he died in April of 1907. On March 7, 1910, Cordelia passed away in prison. Her death certificate listed the cause of death as softening of the brain due to melancholy. She was 56 years old. I have a lot of unanswered questions about this um, particular story. It was actually made into a movie and there has been a book written about it, but I don't know. I, I need more information. I always want more information. You guys know that by now. I always want more information. So after I finished watercoloring all of these cupcakes, I went through and took a glitter pen and added glitter to some of them just because I wanted to. So I thought I would give you a, a little bit of an up close on that. Also, I have found a few photographs. Um, the first one is a picture of the note that was in the candy. The second picture is a picture of John P. Dunning. The next picture is a picture of Mary Elizabeth. This is a picture of Cordelia. And the next one is her um, brazen picture. Thank you all for stopping by my channel today. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Crime and Coloring. I have added a couple of other videos here I think you might enjoy, as well as a subscribe button. If you have not yet subscribed to my channel, I would love it if you did so. Leave me a comment, leave me a thumbs up, and have a really great day.